Hello and welcome to the History of the Germans, episode 4, A Foe Wherever You Go. Thanks a lot for coming back, or if you accidentally just started here, welcome to the show. And I would also like to thank you all for your very useful feedback. Please keep it coming. This is my first podcast and there is a lot I can do better. Okay, back to the show. Last week, we watched Otto's astounding recovery from disaster at the Battle of Andernach in October 939. Otto has now successfully broken the rebellion of his brother Henry, who was supported by a powerful alliance of the Dukes of Franconia and Lothringia, some Saxon nobles and a number of senior bishops, including the primate of Germany, Archbishop Friedrich of Mainz. Otto beat them all, not by superior tactics or exceptional bravery or military might, no, by sheer unbelievable luck. In both key battles, Birten and Andernach, Otto's troops were seriously outnumbered. By September 939, Otto's fortune had sunk so low, he talked about seeking an honourable death. And that makes the final success at the Battle of Andernach nothing short of a miracle. In the perception of the times, this added up to exactly that, an act of God confirming beyond any doubt that Otto is the rightful king. And even beyond the immediate impact on Otto's reign, it sanctioned the constitutional reform of Henry the Fowler, that the kingdom should no longer be divided between the sons of the previous king. These two, I mean by all accounts minor skirmishes, put the keystone into the edifice that would later be called the Holy Roman Empire. Otto used his triumph to move away from his father's style of kingship to the kind of rule he had envisaged for himself at his coronation in Aachen five years earlier. He did not see himself as a first amongst equals, like his father. He saw himself as the new Charlemagne, who ruled as the anointed representative of Christ on earth, controlling both the Lord's temporal as well as the church itself. He immediately went to work and reorganized the kingdom. He confiscated Eberhard's Duchy of Franconia, once one of the mightiest polities in the realm, and added it to the crown estate. The Duchy of Lothringia was initially awarded to the previous duke's son, under the guardianship of one of Otto's closest associates. When that system proved to be too complex for this rather difficult to manage duchy, he gave it to his son-in-law, Conrad the Red. As we heard last episode, Otto made his rebellious and murderous brother, and now best made Henry, into the Duke of Bavaria. Henry had married the daughter of the last incumbent to make the whole thing look a little bit less heavy-handed. And then Otto played the same trick on Duke Hermann of Swabia, his most loyal ally during the Civil War, by marrying his son Ludolf to the Duke's daughter, paving the way to a takeover of that duchy as well, which happened in 949. That means, ten years after the rebellion, Otto and his direct family hold all five duchies directly. The bishops who had joined the rebellion were also subdued. Archbishop Friedrich of Mainz was one of the main conspirators and was put in jail at the Abbey of Fulda. Conditions became quite harsh after letters were found indicating the scheming archbishop was still trying to keep a fight against Otto going. But after a year of penance he was back in the royal favour. He returned to the bishopric where he remained a pain in the proverbial until his very last breath. With his house in order, Otto could now turn his interests and resources to foreign policy. I have posted a map of the Ottonian Kingdom on the Facebook page History of the Germans podcast that should make things a little bit easier. Let's go around clockwise from the north. The Danes are more or less calm as they prefer raiding the richer and more distant English and French. Moving to the northeast, we have the Ridarius, a pagan Slavic tribe. They were beaten in a campaign conducted by Hermann Billung in 936, which stabilized the situation. The same cannot be said for the Slavs living between the Elbe and Oder rivers, which are being instructed in the benevolence of Christianity by Markgraf Gero. These pagans really struggle on the learning curve despite the generous application of fire and sword. In the southeast you have the Bohemians, who shook off the Ottonian yoke in 938. Even further south you have the Hungarians, who still raid regularly into Italy and southern Germany. And finally in the south you have the Italians, and then in the southwest the Burgundians, which will take up most of our story today. 
Last but not least, you have Louis King of France, who, like every French king before him and every French king after him, wants Lothringia back. Let's start our detailed review with the French. There is still one of the conspirators in Henry's rebellion we need to talk about, Louis IV, King of France. Admittedly, Louis' involvement ended up being more symbolic than practical. However, Otto needed to neutralize him, if not for questions of honor, then to protect Lothringia. Lothringia had moved back and forth between France and Germany for more than a hundred years. The Lothringian magnates liked this a lot, because it meant they could play the French and the German king off against each other as they pleased. They did that during the rebellion of Brother Henry, when they asked Louis of France to become their overlord again. Their game failed in 939, when Otto managed to regain control of the duchy shortly after the Battle of Andernach. However, the problem did not go away with the death of Duke Gilbert and the collapse of the rebellion. You may remember that Otto got hold of the young sons of Gilbert, Duke of Lothringia, but he did not get hold of his widow, Gerberga. Louis IV managed to capture her, and presumably, out of a sudden burst of love and passion, married her. And to make absolutely clear what that was all about, he christened his oldest son, Lothar, giving him his mission in life. If that was not unusual enough, note that Gerberga was Otto's sister, and despite the abduction and all that, she was and remained the main support to Louis throughout all that happens next. Again, in 939, Otto had called upon the major nobles of France, namely William Longsword of Normandy, Heribert of Vermandois, and Hugh Capet, to help against Gilbert and Louis. In 940, it was payback time, and he met up with them again, bringing along a large German army to fight King Louis. The Allies had already occupied Reims and installed a new archbishop in this, the most important bishopric in France, and the place of royal coronation. From there, they moved to Laos the most important and most impressive-looking stronghold of the Carolingian kings of France. Otto may or may not have captured Lau. In any case, King Louis is next seen, and, forgive me because this is now going to be very confusing, in the Duchy of Burgundy, whose duke succumbs to Otto and his allies. That duchy is the third of the Burgundies existing in the 10th century, which include the Duchy of Burgundy, the Kingdom of Upper Burgundy, and the Kingdom of Lower Burgundy, which is also known as the Kingdom of Arles and Provence. Do not worry about that, we will look at the Burgundies again later on. Back to simpler things. This campaign very much put Louis back into his box. And that was exactly where Otto wanted him to be. Well, he seems to have squashed him a bit too far down into that box, and now had to work hard convincing the French magnates to keep Louis on as king. Otto did not want Louis to be completely defeated, because in that case one of Louis's powerful magnates would have taken the throne and become a serious adversary. It was much better to keep Louis on as king as long as he and his magnates were preoccupied with their perennial quarrels. So over the next couple of decades Otto would support the magnates whenever Louis was about to get hold of a real power base, as he almost did in Normandy. And then he would side with Louis when he was down on his luck, which he quite often was. And that way, France remained weak, Lothringia German, and Otto the de facto decision-maker. These regular incursions into France offered great opportunities for the fine sports of pointless sieges, burning of crops, and massacring of peasants, but also for displays of childish boasts. Hugh Capet, the most powerful of the French nobles, stated that the Saxons were useless in war, and that he could swallow seven of the Saxon lances in one go. Otto's measured response was to order his entire army to wear women's straw hats, which was supposedly making the French wild. Needless to say that nobody ever really won in that war, but it kept the French down. Result. Just as an aside, a hundred years earlier, when Arnulf of Carinthia was in a similar position to Otto, the magnates had offered Arnulf the crown of France. That they never offered to Otto. Over the period of these hundred years, the identities of the two separate kingdoms of East and West France had firmed up so much that a return to the empire of Charlemagne had now become very unlikely. That does not mean the inhabitants saw themselves as either French or German in any modern sense of national identity. It is more that power structures had developed that worked best within either a West Francian or an East Francian context. 
a UKP was happy to fight his fellow French magnates and his king for the control of the kingdom with the help of a German king. Whilst the Duke of Franconia or Bavaria was mostly focused on the affairs of East Francia, occasionally using the King of France to support his objectives. But neither would UKP submit to a German king, nor would the Duke of Franconia ever swear allegiance to a King of France. And in that way, affairs in France continued throughout Otto's reign, without much preoccupying anyone after the larger campaigns of 946. So we're going round the dial clockwise, we need now to talk about the Slavs. In the 940s, the kingdom of Otto ended pretty much on the Elbe River. The people living on the opposite shore were mostly Slavs, who had moved in there after the Great Migration had led to a shift westwards of the Germanic tribes. The Slavs were not a coherent nation, but split into several, often warring tribes. The two largest coherent groups were the Poles and the Bohemians. And at that time there was a buffer zone between the Germans and the Poles, defined by the Elbe and Oder rivers. This area was inhabited by a variety of different smaller Slavic tribes, including the Ridarius, the Abudrites, the Veleti, the Heveli and the Sorbs. The fighting on the eastern border had started in 929, when King Henry the Fowler tried out his shiny new army in the battles with the Slavs. From that time onwards, fighting never actually stopped. The main actors on the northeastern frontier were Otto's friends, Hermann Billung and Markgraf Gero. As you may remember in episode 2, their appointment had resulted in much grumbling amongst the Saxon nobles and in the case of Gero's led straight away to Tankmar's rebellion. These two leaders seem to have employed quite different strategies. Hermann Billung led a successful campaign against the Redarius in 936, but afterwards records of his activities become scarce. He might have had some run-ins with the Danes, though that is only recorded in one unreliable source. Apart from the Redarius, the other main tribe in his area of responsibilities were the Abodrites, with whom he conducted friendly relationships. He seems to have been much more focused on domestic affairs, mainly in subjugating his elder brother Wichmann and his family. His colleague Markgraf Gero was taking a tougher line. His approach was by all accounts as bloody, as endless and as relentless as the conquest of Saxony itself by Charlemagne 150 years earlier. We already met him in the last episode, when he had murdered 30 helpless, drunken Slavic leaders at a feast. Not exactly the way to make friends. He specialised in wanton destruction of sacred pagan shrines and enforced baptisms, which resulted in exactly the kind of eternal rebellions and resentments you would expect. Over the decades, Gero managed to push the boundaries of the kingdom east and north almost up to the Polish border. And on the back of this successful demonstration of Christian charity, King Otto founded a total of five new bishoprics in the Slavic lands. One of these was Brandenburg, which was the nucleus of what would later become Prussia. We will see how much the Slavs appreciated this generosity when we talk about the reign of Otto's unlucky son, Otto II. Another pressing issue was further south, Bohemia. Bohemia is an area roughly where the modern Czech Republic is found today. Bohemia had been ruled by good King Wenceslaus, yes, that good King Wenceslaus, until the year 935. Wenceslaus, who wasn't really a king but just a duke, had to submit to Henry the Fowler in 929. As part of the submission, he had to accept German missionaries to come over and introduce the Latin cult. That sat awkwardly with his subjects, and so his brother Boleslav had good King Wenceslaus killed. When in 938 Otto became preoccupied with his brother's rebellions, Boleslav decided to shed the Frankish oppressors once and for all, and refused to give homage to Otto. Otto's natural response was to invade. However, his elite household troops were otherwise occupied, so he had to send a division of what Widukind of Corbe describes as the Legion of Thieves. These troops consisted of offenders from across the realm who were offered the choice between punishment, usually involving a reduction in the number of available limbs, or joining the army. These valiant knights set off from Merseburg for Prague. As it happened, they had not fully changed their spots, and when they had won a smaller skirmish, they focused more on plundering the corpses of the Bohemians than keeping watch. Boleslav fell on them with the might of his remaining forces, and the thieves lost their limbs after all. 
This quarrel lasted until 950 when Otto joined up with his brother to invade Bohemia with a more sizable and presumably more professional army. Bolesnav, smart general that he was, almost immediately succumbed and swore fealty to Otto. From then on, Bohemia was an integral part of the kingdom until 1806. If you ever needed proof that the Middle Ages had little notion of national identity, the role of Bohemia is proof. The Bohemians were undoubtedly Slavs and spoke ancient Czech. Their nobles were, at least until the 14th century, mostly Czech, not Franks or Germans. Despite these differences, Bohemia was an integral part of the Holy Roman Empire. Though the kings of Bohemia were named kings, their political role was similar to the dukes and other princes of the realm. The king of Bohemia was one of the nobles that were considered essential for the royal election to be valid, and he would later become one of the seven electors. And let us not forget good King Wenceslaus, who for his pains became a saint, much revered in England for reasons I really still don't quite understand. And next up are the Hungarians. The Battle of Reed and a subsequent battle in 938 diverted their efforts to Italy and minor incursions into Bavaria. In 944, Duke Berthold allegedly put a stop to that. Despite these successes, the fear of the Hungarians did not go away. Throughout the whole period, castle building kept going at a rapid pace in expectation of a major invasion. Now we've come almost full circle and reached the south and southwest, Italy and the kingdoms of Burgundy. And that is where it becomes complicated. Last time we mentioned Italy on this podcast was when Charlemagne went down to Pavia to pick up the crown of the Lombards. Since then, things have gone a bit out of control. Italy has fragmented into multiple states and cities. The biggest states were the Kingdom of the Lombards, or often called the Kingdom of Italy, which only comprised northern Italy. Then you had the papal states around Rome, and further south the three Lombard duchies of Spoleto, Benevento and Capua that were loosely related to that Kingdom of Italy. South of them were the Byzantines, who still ruled the heel and the toe of Italy. The Muslims had taken over Sicily, and had a beachhead at Fraxinetum, today the gorgeous village of Lagarde Frenet above Saint-Tropez on the Côte d'Azur. Finally, you had the independent cities of Naples, Amalfi, Genoa, and most important of these, Venice. Venice was impossible to conquer for traditional land forces and had already become the crucial link between East and West that nobody could afford to lose. The so-called Kingdom of Italy had been part of the Kingdom of Lothar, you remember that short-lived political entity created in 843, slot between France and Germany that has already, and will continue, to cause endless headaches. After Lothar's immediate successes had died out, the southern part of his kingdom had split into Upper Burgundy, around Besançon and Basel, and Lower Burgundy, or now often called Provence, or the Kingdom of Arles, that stretched all the way from Lyon to Marseille and east towards Nice, and last but not least, the Kingdom of Italy. Ah, and there's also the Duchy of Burgundy, and really, just forget about that one. The rulers of these three entities were constantly attempting to consolidate them into one kingdom under their control. I better spare you the ins and outs of this. Louis Prandt of Cremona has written a totally biased but supremely amusing chronicle of the goings-on, including all the smutty gossip. Over the next week, I will publish his juiciest bits on my Facebook page. History of the Germans podcast. Sign up so you won't miss out. What follows here is a very stripped down version of the political and dynastic movements in Italy and Burgundy up until 950. The key protagonist we're interested in is Adelheid. Adelheid was the daughter of King Rudolf of Upper Burgundy. We've met Rudolf before, he's the one who sold the Holy Lance to Henry the Fowler. Rudolf had also made an attempt to get hold of the Kingdom of Italy in the 930s, but was sent back home packing. Anyway, when her father died in 937, and her six-year-old brother Conrad became King of Upper Burgundy, his neighbour to the south, Hugh, who was already the King of Lower Burgundy and King of Italy, tried to annex Upper Burgundy. He invaded and forced Adelheid's mother Bertha to marry him, and Adelheid herself was married to his son Lothar allowing Hugh to control Italy, Lower and Upper Burgundy, would leave Otto with one excessively powerful ruler all along his southern and southwestern border. 
That was a bit too close for comfort to Otto, and he decided to intervene. Otto declared himself protector of Adelheid's little brother, the young king of Upper Burgundy, who had fled to his court. Otto banked a few swords to shields, and that seemed to have done the trick, since Hugh left Upper Burgundy with only Bertha and Adelheid in tow. The next decade, Otto and Hugh rubbed along fine. Hugh was busy bashing local Italian lords and getting involved with a very interesting Roman lady you will meet next week. Hugh had to give up these distractions when one of his vassals, Margraf Berenga of Ivrea, kept trying to dislodge him as king of Italy. Berenga, with some moral support from Otto, was finally successful in 945, forcing Hugh to abdicate in favour of his son Lothar. With Lothar becoming king of Italy, our Adelheid, now 15 years old, became Queen of Italy. That was quite a neat arrangement as it combined the three contenders for the crown of Italy, Adelheid representing the line of Upper Burgundy, Lothar representing the line of Lower Burgundy and Berenga representing Italy. It might look neat, but in reality Lothar was just a puppet king, Berenga had total control over the reins of power. This neat arrangement fell apart when Lothar unexpectedly died in 950. Berenga had to take the plunge and declare himself king of Italy without really having much legitimacy apart from having the bigger guns. But that was not his only problem. He also had to figure out what to do with the young queen Adelheid. You see, Adelheid was not only blood-related to almost everyone who was anyone in 10th century Europe, she was also enormously rich in her own right. To top it up, it was customary for usurpers to derive their right to rule from marriage to the wife or daughter of the recently deceased ruler, just as King Louis of France or Duke Henry of Bavaria or Duke Ludolf of Swabia. You see why Adelheid was now the hottest potato in all of Italy, if not all of Europe, if they had had potatoes then. Maybe she was the hottest parsnip. According to some chroniclers, Berenga proposed for her to marry his son Adalbert, but Adelheid refused. But even if that was not true, allowing such a powerful person running around in Italy to be picked up by some random chancer was not an option. So Berenga had her thrown into a prison in a fortress on Lake Garda. Whilst Adelheid, the richest heiress in Europe, and a 19-year-old beauty lay in her cell contemplating what to do, world politics was set in motion. Okay, let's go back to the last sentence. Adelheid, Europe's richest heiress and an acclaimed beauty, is held in a jail by some jumped-up Markgraf? Any takers? Anyone? And just when it gets interesting, the music starts playing. Time is up. Next week, we'll see how all this blows up, first in Berenga's face and then in Otto's as well. Lots of shenanigans to come. I really hope you will join us next week. And in the meantime, if you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and since you are there, why don't you leave a positive rating and a review on Apple Podcasts? I do not know what that does, but it makes me feel warm and fuzzy. And that is nice when one is locked up in COVID land.